Um, so again, I'm Casey Rossetti, a regional grant manager with Polycom, the video conferencing equipment manufacturer. And my purpose uh, is to provide different types of support to telehealth organizations, or really anybody who's eligible for grants, um, to help them you know, develop their project, identify their needs, and also provide grant application assistance. But today, we want to talk about our, some of the best practices for leveraging grants in telehealth space. Um, and next door, there's a session going on called, you know, how do I get paid for this? This session could be called, how do I pay for this, right? So we're going to have the ladies talk about USAC broadband funding. But from our, from our perspective, my perspective, it's about how to, how to fund the equipment. And so um, some of the learning objectives today are going to be, you know, different sources of telehealth funding, where to find information on grant programs if you're not aware of that already, best practices for obtaining telehealth funding, and we're going to go into as much detail as I can during this, this short time on the Rust Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant, um, premier source for telehealth equipment. Um, so sources for rural health care funding. Uh, there's three different buckets, basically, federal grants, state grants, foundations. Uh, there are many federal agencies um, that are funding telehealth. We heard um, Dr. Sanders talking about National Science Foundation. I'm going to talk to you guys about Department of Agriculture. You've certainly heard of HRSA and PCORI. Uh, many other groups that are doing all different types of telehealth funding. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the major foundations that, that we've, we've worked with and we've seen customers leverage in order to access funding for telehealth. And a lot of them will actually fund more than just the equipment as well. Some of them are very you know, heavily research oriented and there's a lot of funding for personnel and the uh, programs in which to, to bring it all together. Um, so let's talk for a moment on where to search for grants. And there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, if you have experience with this, this is really common knowledge, but the Federal Register is a great place to start. That's where grants are going to post first. Um, you can get on the email notifications as well. So it's kind of like what I've, every morning I wake up, it's probably about 5 a.m. when the email comes through, just roll through the list of grants, see if there's anything out there that we are not already aware of that would make a good fit for, you know, many of the different projects that we're working on. And so that's what, what our team kind of does for, for the folks that we work with, is keep an eye out, monitoring funding sources. Um, but, you know, you guys can be doing the exact same thing that we're doing. We encourage you to do that. Um, Grants.gov, you can go to the federal agencies. If you're just focused on HRSA, if you just want to look at a specific program, you can get on, on the funding forecast for those uh, programs. And um, in addition to the proposed budget, for the pr president's proposed budget at the beginning of the year, when you go on to a website like HRSA, you can see all the grants that have happened in the past. Um, I also recommend you look at old you know, grants as well. If you're looking at a specific program of interest, go back and look at some of those previously funded awards. But this is a great place to kind of start to look for you know, those types of resources. Um, rural Health Information Hub is a great website for um, rural funding projects or rural funding uh, programs. And uh, they do cover federal, state, and foundation grants as well. So you get a whole, the whole gambit, not just federal like you would get from grants.gov. Uh, Foundation Center is also an excellent source. It's about $1,000 a year, you know, for a subscription, for a, a premium subscription. But you can go on and search by, you know, location, by subject, um, types of giving, uh, just lots of different interests and, and topics, uh, subjects, so that you can pull together a list of funders that are giving in your specific area for your specific reasons. Um, and we're glad to pull those reports, too. That's part of what we do is provide funding reports. If we speak with you and find out there's not a grant that we're experts on that we can, you know, work with you on, then we'll just, you know, start that new process. Looking for foundation grants. And I want to spend a moment on this slide. This is preparing for grant success. Um, a lot of the best practices that we preach, uh, just in general, okay? Um, first thing is get active and start planning now. The last thing you want to do is start working on a grant the moment that it's announced. You may only have a 30 to 60 day window and you're going to be up against the wall the whole time trying to put together a really competitive proposal. So really get, get active, start planning now, get prepared for the, the variety of funding sources that are coming down the pike. Um, reach out and establish or enhance partnerships. You'll see a common thread with grants these days are required partnerships, either in just, just to be an eligible applicant or how the program works together. They, they, are either, they have a lot of these required partnerships. So go ahead and reach out, um, working with uh, your community entities. It could be the school system. It could be um, you know, the government agencies. It could be economic development. But all these folks have a role you know, to play in, in the grants process in many cases. Um, probably one of the more 
uh, important things that we would recommend is form kind of a, a grant-seeking team, form a committee of some sort. Um, it doesn't have to be a grant-seeking committee, but a committee that will come together to really line out all the different needs, um, to, to get everything put, and we would call it, kind of call it a whiteboard session, where you really just bring a meeting of the minds together, brainstorm about all the different initiatives that you could be looking at, um, things that you want to do, where you're at today, where you want to be in five years, and then the funding is obviously a big piece of that. How are we going to fund that? Um, and if you have the right people in the room and you have the right guidance, you guys can start to forecast these opportunities months ahead, start working on them, and then when the grant comes out, um, even if there were changes to the guidelines, you won't have a whole lot of work you know, needed to do to adjust to that. So having these groups together, coming together, from, and having key um, personnel from key stakeholder entities brought together. A lot of folks just start this internally, you know, as far as a committee is concerned. But we do recommend, you know, engaging your partner, you know, organizations and bringing them into the fold as well. Identify technology partners that can fulfill your needs. Hi, we're Polycom. And of course, there's going to be a lot of other, uh, you know, technologies that you may need. And, as a, a, and I should say that when we help write grants, there's oftentimes tons of different types of technology. We, we are there to help support you. Yes, we want to earn your business in the process, but part of that is really just helping you, you know, understand what you need and how to, how to get there. Uh, follow legislation and information about upcoming programs. You can really get an inside track on new emerging grant programs simply by, you know, reading some of the new articles that are coming out. And if you have um, relationships with elected officials, uh, really work those to, to, a, to a point in which you can kind of understand what's coming down the pike. Garner their support as well. Um, beyond just a support letter, I'm sure all of you have tracked down support letters for grants before, and th you know that does look good, but them basically going to bat for your project um, is a whole other level of support that, that you guys can garner. Let's see, pre uh, review previously funded grant abstracts. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, they, they usually also have a point of contact with that grant abstract, so you can reach out and talk to that person about what, tell us more, the abstract is very short, you don't get a ton of detail. You'll find them very willing to engage in these discussions and help share their knowledge and their experience with the grant and can even kind of give you some tips, you know, that you could really put to good use. Um, so take it that extra step and contact those folks. Some grants actually require you to establish contact and coordinate with a previously funded applicant. Not so much in the telehealth space, more in the Department of Labor and, and so forth. But, you know, in the case that that comes up, you'll already, you know, be in contact with people. Um, Let's see. Okay, consider a collaborative approach. And the, the point here is that maybe your organization isn't uh, an eligible applicant for a grant that you want to go after. But if, you're working, but if you have a foundation or you're working with a school system that is eligible for that grant, then you become the partner. Now, you may be the leader. You may be driving the project. And this happens all the time. But then we find who the eligible applicant is, bring them into the mix. And honestly, they're pretty happy if somebody else is driving <laughs> that initiative for them. And all they really have to do is sign forms and you know, return calls and that sort of thing. Um, so don't miss an opportunity just because your organization may not be eligible. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, many grants require partnerships. And think about the value, the ways that you can add value, you know, to, to that partnership. Uh, avoiding common mistakes, okay? So one of the things that we have to do up front when you're dealing with federal grants, if any of you guys have written grants recently or been involved in them, is something called the grants.gov registration and the SAM, System Award Management Registration. You just want to be on top of this. Make sure that you check this information using your login um, at the beginning of the grants process because it may, if, if everything is not in good standing, it may take several weeks or a couple of weeks to, to get it there. And we've had a lot of, you know, last minute, you know, rushes uh, trying to get this stuff uh, figured out before, you know, the grant was submitted online. Because once you hit submit, if that information isn't up to date, the grant will get kicked out without a second thought. So really, be on top of that. Um, have you authorized your, uh, your authorized organizational representative, the AOR? Um, that's also very important in a, in a common step missed in the process where, yeah, we've got our grants.gov registration. Yeah, our SAM registration is, is, doesn't expire to the end of this year, but that person that's on it is not the person involved in this project, and that, that can be a big problem for you. Um, so start, start gathering required documents as soon as you can. Check guidelines to, sure, to, know, to ensure exactly what's required. And also maintain that documentation. You know, beyond um, it, it once awarded, you know, you'll you'll talk to the grant program officer. They'll give you all the details that are required. But just keep good records, okay? 
and check to see if an evaluation is required. Many grants do require that, and they'll cover the cost of the evaluation, but you want to be, you know, that's something that does take a while to, to pull together at times. So uh, if, you, if you have one on site, we still recommend that you engage a third party, um, not, not somebody internal to your organization. Okay, um, so here's a list of common uh, grants that we work on every year for healthcare services as well as healthcare education. And we do a lot of grants as it relates to just CME-based projects. Maybe it's not service delivery uh, that's your major need right now. Maybe it's just training the professionals. Um, so we can do those types of projects as well. HRSA, HRSA grants, there's four HRSA grants that, and this is just an example. I mean, we could probably put up three slides of information, but I just don't want to overwhelm at this point. Um, so four HRSA grants that are pretty popular, two USDA grants. Um, I'm going to talk about the distance learning and telemedicine grant. I've got a, a slide on that, but before I do, I do want to just put in a, wait, let me see if I have, yeah, okay, so the Delta Healthcare Services grant is only focused at Delta County, so it's a great grant for Mississippi. Um, and it covers any type of development of healthcare services out to rural areas, healthcare job training, and healthcare education for the public. And those services or that type of healthcare education, um, you define, right? It's mental health, it's primary care, it's, you know, um, any specialty service. Any of this will fit into the program as long as your region has a, a, a specific need for that backed up by data. Um, and, of course, that's, that's, that's why you're focusing on it. You will have the numbers, you'll have the need for that, um, we'll be able to use it. That, that grant can fund up to a million dollars per award, and it's going to be announced here very soon. It does cover the equipment as well as personnel. We did a grant with UMMC last year that covered a telehealth coordinator, had IT support, and it paid for a nurse to provide health care to Cahoma College and a few of their partners. Um, and they're in the process of rolling that out right now. Um, no match to that grant as well, so huge. Um, if there's interest, let me know. We'll, we'll, we'll give you some information about it so you can explore it for yourself. The USDA Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant, I'm going to end on this grant to talk really specifically. It's, it's been around since the uh, mid-30s, or excuse me, mid, uh, since 1993. <laughs> mid-30s. I'm going back to Jay Sanders, you know. Um, <laughs> so it goes back to the mid-90s and um, funds up to half a million dollars per award for equipment only. Now this is focused on extremely rural outreach to town populations under 5,000. And, uh, and it also maps to, you know, high national school lunch program percentages. That's the poverty indicator for this grant. So Mississippi is the poster child for this Rust Distance Learning Grant. And we do a number of applications in the state every year, but we're not doing enough telehealth. We're just doing it mainly with UMMC and a few other players. We really, I mean, because of uh, recent legislation, you know, now is the time to really start to expand. Um, and this is a great grant to do that. Um, you can apply for more than one in a given year as an applicant organization. If you have a big service area or you just have, you need more than half a million in funding for the equipment, you can apply for two or three grants that are very similar just with different sites listed in there. And we've seen them fund those time and time again. Um, they also love repeat applicants. So if you're successful the first time or, or let's say you're not successful but you get it the next time, they love to see people come back and do projects of expansion. Um, and they do talk about giving priority to projects where there is no existing equipment. So if you're just looking to, to roll it out in, with your organization, then this, uh, this is a great grant to look at because you'll get those. It's not actual points, but it's just ex extra consideration. Um, another scoring criteria with this grant is uh, ha having sites in strike force counties. And pretty much the whole state is, is strike force. So, you know, pretty much any grant. Um, any DLT grant that say they're going to get those 15 points. In terms of timing, it's a little bit further out. Uh, last year it opened in January and closed in March. It was a 60-day window. But the three years before that, it was in the summer. And four years before that, it was in the spring. So it's kind of a moving target, but we're expecting it to come out again in January. Um, and we're preparing, we're helping people prepare for it now. Because it, it is a beast of an application. Um, it's not hard to report on once you get the grant awarded. Um, it's pretty, pretty lax on the backside as it relates to other federal grants and the reporting requirements. Um, but, you know, getting the grant is the hard part. The thing is that we've got it down to a formula. We understand the scoring criteria. We can provide really specific feedback on the changes you would need to make or adjustments you might need to make to your partner list or your, your project in order to be more competitive. Um, and we've just, just to give you some rough numbers, over the last 14 years that we've worked on this grant, We've helped submit anywhere between 30 to 95 applications and have an average success rate of about 75%.
So it's, I mean, we've, we've figured it out. And when we don't get it the first year, we'll go back the next year knowing where we missed the mark. They give you the scores for everything and we'll help, help you, you know, go after that again. Um, so the purpose here, the, the T is obviously in telemedicine. It's really just to equalize access to healthcare and education across the board. And they love to see combo projects too. So if it's, you know, telehealth as well as, you know, training for professionals or public education makes a great fit for this grant. So I really encourage you guys to look at this, the Delta Health Grant as well, and to reach out and really just talk about all, their, all the other funding sources that are out there for you, federal, state, and private.